Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Janmad Yasya Yato Nivayad Itaratas Charte Suavigya Swarat Tene Brahma Hirdaya Adikavaye Muyantiyat Surayaha Tejo Vari Medam Yata Vini Mayo Yatra Chisargo Misha Tejo Vari Medam Yata Vini Mayo Dam na swena sada nirasta kuhakam satyam param di mahi. Dam na swena sada nirasta kuhakam satyam param di mahi. O my Lord Shri Krishna, son of Vasudeva. O my Lord Shri Krishna, son of Vasudeva. O all pervading personality of Godhead. O all pervading personality of Godhead. And from my respectful basis unto you. And from my respectful basis. I meditate upon Lord Shri Krishna because he is the absolute truth. I mean. And the primal cause of all causes of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji. the original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen on fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes temporarily manifested by the reaction of the three modes of nature appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna, who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode, which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma projita kaitravotra Paramo nirmatsanam satam. Vedyam vasavam atra vastu. Shivadam tapatrayon mulanam. Shimad bhagavate mahamuni krite. Kim vaparer ishwaraha. Sadyo hide avarudyate tra. Krite bihi sususa bhistakshanat. Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth, which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold misery. This beautiful Bhagavatam, compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity, is sufficient in itself for God-realization. What is the need of any other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nagamak kapaturur galitam palam. Sukumakad amrita dravya samvitam. Pibata bhagavatam rasam alayam. Muhur ahorasika buvi bhavukaha. Oh, expert and thoughtful men, relish Srimad Bhagavatam. The mature fruit of the desire to Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadeva Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Although its nectarine juice was already relishable for all, including liberated souls. Shinvatam Swakata Krishna.
Kunya Shravana Kirtana Vidyantaksto Bhadrani Vidunoti Srihit Satam To hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures or to hear about him directly through the Bhagavad Gita is itself righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna, who, who is dwelling in everyone's heart, acts as a best-wishing friend and purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Sloke Bhakti Bhavati Naistiki In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam and from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. Tadarajas tamo bhavo kamalo badayas chaye chete etara navidam sitpam sattve prasiddhati By development of devotional service, one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus, material lust and avarice are diminished. Evam prasana manaso Bhagavat bhakti yogataha Bhagavat tattva vijnana Mukta sangha sichayate When these impurities are wiped away, the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness. Steady. Becomes enlivened by devotional service and understands the science of God perfectly. Vidyate hridaya grantis Siddhyante sarvasam saya Shiyante chasya karmani Drista Ivatmanishwari. Thus, Bhakti Yoga severs the hard knot of material affection and enables one to come at once to the stage of Samsayam Samagram, understanding the Supreme Absolute Truth Personality of Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 13, Verse number 51. Nispaditam devakrityam avasesam pratikshate tavad yuyam avekshadvam bhavad yavad iheshwaraha Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. The Lord has already performed His duties to help the demigods, and is, He is awaiting the rest. You Pandavas may wait as long as the Lord is here on earth. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. The Lord descends from His abode, Krishna Loka, the topmost planet in the spiritual sky in order to help the demigod administrators of this material world when they are greatly vexed by the asuras who are envious not only of the Lord but also of his devotees. As referred to above, the conditioned living beings contact material association by their own choice 
dictated by a strong desire to lord it over the resources of the material world and become imitation lords of all they survey. Everyone is trying to become an imitation god. There is keen competition amongst the imita such imitation gods. And such competitors are generally known as asuras. When there are too many asuras in the world, then it becomes hell for those who are devotees of the Lord. Due to the growth of the asuras, the mass of people who are generally devoted to the Lord by nature and the pure devotees of the Lord, including the demigods and higher planets, pray to the Lord for relief. And the Lord either descends personally from his abode or deputes some of his devotees to remodel the fallen condition of human society or even animal society. Wow. Such disruptions take place not only in human society but also among animals, birds, or other living beings, including the demigods in the higher planets. Lord Sri Krishna descended personally to vanquish asuras like Kamsa, Charasanda, and Sisupala. And during the reign of Maharaj Yudhisthira, almost all these asuras were killed by the Lord. Now he was awaiting the annihilation of his own dynasty, called the Yadu Vamsa, who appeared by his will in this world. He wanted to take them away before his own departure to his eternal abode. Narada, like Vidura, did not disclose the imminent annihilation of the Yadu dynasty, but indirectly gave hint to the king and his brothers to wait till the incident happened and the Lord departed. Srila Prabhupada Patita Pavan So, Krishna has his plan, and we, unfortunate living beings, have our plan. Our plan is to dominate material nature, or some part of it, for our own sense gratification. And the Lord's plan is to help us overcome such perverted tendencies and desires, and desire to go back to Godhead and be eternally with the Lord, free from the cycle of birth, death, old age, and disease, and all the other miseries caused by the Kala Chakra or the Kala Rupa and so forth, uh, time and, uh, and the modes of material nature and the influence of Maya, etc. Well, uh, suffering is necessary to help people wake up to the reality of their position. Now, some people wake up or some people just keep struggling on and on, uh, not waking up, uh, and they get more and more frustrated. And then some people just commit suicide, uh, thinking that there's no hope for them to have any success in sense gratification in the material world. There are many such very, very frustrated asuras in the world but even in their extreme frustration, they still don't give up. They still have hopes of succeeding in the material world. And this is their great misfortune. This is explained in Bhagavad Gita. There's extensive explanation of the Asura mentality. Dambo darpo bimanas cha krodad krodaha parushyam evacha. Agyanam Jabijatasya Parta Sampadam Asurim. Pride, arrogance, conceit, anger, harshness, and ignorance, these qualities belong to those of demoniac nature, O Sana Prita. It's the sixteenth chapter, fourth verse. In this verse, the royal road to hell is described. The demoniac want to make a show of religion and advancement in spiritual science, although they do not follow the principles. They are always arrogant or proud in possessing some type of education or so much wealth. They desire to be worshipped by others and demand respectability, although they do not command respectability. Over trifles, 
They become very angry and speak harshly, not gently. They do not know what should be done and what should not be done. They do everything whimsically according to their own desire, and they do not recognize any authority. These demoniac qualities are taken on by them from the beginning of their bodies in the wombs of their mothers, and as they grow, they manifest all these inauspicious qualities. So this is a exact uh, description of the demons. Now, there's several points here that are very disturbing. One is that these demoniac qualities are taken on by them from the beginning of their bodies. That means from very uh, childhood. In the womb, and in the beginning of their bodies, in the wombs of their mother, not only in the childhood, already in the womb of the mother. And as they grow, they manifest all these inauspicious qualities. One example of this was Duryodhana. It was predicted, even before he was born, that uh, he was going to be the cause of the destruction of the entire Kuru dynasty. But his father was weak-minded and attached, uh, attached to society, friendship, and love, so-called love. And so when his son was born, instead of uh, ban banishing him, he protected him. Now, you might say, well, that's natural. Well, yes and no. Uh, great uh, uh, astrologers, they can tell what a person is going to be like and based on their previous life. And therefore, Dhritarashtra was warned, but he didn't listen. And what happened? Uh, his son, Duryodhana, was the cause of the destruction of the whole, uh, almost the entire dynasty. So that's one point, and it's, it's a shocking point, that the demonic qualities are taken on by the Asuras from the beginning of their bodies in the wombs of their mothers, and as they grow, they manifest all these inauspicious qualities. Another very uh, disturbing point is that uh, they demand respect, but they cannot command respect. Now, someone might say, well, wait a minute, what's the difference between demanding and commanding? Well, when you uh, demand respect, you're, you're saying, uh, well, you have to respect me because I have this position and, uh, and I am in a position of authority and I have this and I have that. Okay, that's demanding. Commanding is by your example. You don't have to demand people to respect you. They will naturally respect you by your example of humility, cleanliness internally and externally. The mind is clean and the body is clean. And uh, the uh, self-control, self-discipline, and uh, general affection and kindness and uh, being empathetic and compassionate and so forth. Because of these, uh, these good qualities, and uh, they're more than good in the, in the pure devotee, they're transcendentally good. Uh, because that means they are sustained. They're not uh, some part of the day one is real nice and the next part of the day they're real mean. They're consistently in all situations uh, very, very... Uh, surrender to the will of Krishna. Therefore, they represent him in an in a, uh, excellent way. So, this uh, uh, commanding and demanding, you have to understand the difference. They're, they don't mean the same thing. Uh, when a person is genuinely good in all circumstances and always Krishna conscious, never forgetting Krishna, people notice it. And they uh, respect such a person naturally. Okay, so there's another interesting point, uh, going back to these inherent demoniac qualities. Uh, Krishna says, Daivi sampad vimokshaya nibandai ya surimata ma sampadam daivim abhijato sipandavam. 
So Krishna is speaking to Arjuna and he says, the transcendental qualities are conducive to liberation, whereas the demoniac qualities make for bondage. Do not worry, O son of Pandu, Arjuna, for you are born with the divine qualities. Ah, this is really interesting. So therefore, somebody might say, oh, well, this proves that there is, uh, uh, there is a predetermined fate of living beings. Ah, well, let's, let's discuss this now. First of all, we read the purport. Prabhupada explains, Lord Krishna encouraged Arjuna by telling him that he was not born with demoniac qualities. His involvement in the fight was not demoniac because he was considering the pros and cons. Ah, now, that's an important point. A devotee will always consider what's called the cholerary effects I mean, not cholerary, collateral effects of his action before he acts. Collateral effects means what effect his action will have on people. And he, he considers that before he acts. So that is considering the pros and cons of an action. He was considering whether the respectable persons such as Bisma and Drona should be killed or not. So he was not acting under the influence of anger, false prestige, or harshness. This is the main point. When we are so uh, contaminated by passion and, and uh, or represented as lust and avarice uh, and, uh, and greed, uh, passion and ignorance, uh, which uh, was represented by lust and greed and uh, self-destructive behavior, at that time, uh, we're acting under the influence of anger, false prestige, or harshness. And therefore, we will be very abusive and harmful. But in the case of Arjuna, because he's transcendentally situated, he's considering the pros and cons of his action before he acts. He doesn't let anger, harshness, false prestige force him to act, but he considers in, in a serene mind what will happen if he acts in a certain way. Therefore, Arjuna was not of the quality of the demons. Yeah, the demons, they just act out of harshness. Just like one minute, Kamsa is driving the chariot and leading his newly married sister, and his new son-in-law, Vasudeva, to Vasudeva's home, right? And then he hears this voice, this celestial voice, says, oh, you, you don't realize, but the uh, eighth son of your, your sister will kill you. Right away, he's going to kill his sister. He went from this happy, joyful, uh, you know, wedding uh, tradition to he's going to kill his sister. I said, that's a demon. They don't consider what they're doing. And then Vasudeva, having self-control, very calmly tries to reason with him and promises him that he will bring every son that's born to Kamsa, and Kamsa can do whatever he wants with the son. So because Kamsa, because Vasudeva commanded respect by his goodness, by his continual steady goodness, uh, Kamsa believed him. He said, okay, you're an honest guy, I know that. So I've, I'll, I'll accept this, but uh, you have to keep your promise. And of course, Vasudeva did. So Vasudeva is not acting out of harshness or false prestige or anger, but Kamsa was acting completely under the influence. Yeah. This is the class, bro. This is the class. Uh, it should have been here earlier, Prabhu. It starts at 6.15. It starts 6.15. Yes. No, it's 6.15. Every day, 6.15.
Anyway, it's, it's almost uh, it's 6.40 right now. Hare Krishna. So our class has already started, so I'll continue right now. Okay, the class has already started, but uh, I'll uh, pick up a little bit from where we just left off. We're talking about Canto 1, Chapter 13, Verse Number 50, in which uh, Narada Muni is speaking to uh, Yudhisthira Maharaj, and he says, The Lord has already performed his duties to help the demigods, and he is awaiting the rest. You Pandavas may wait as long as the Lord is here on earth. So Krishna descends usually to help the demigods that are in trouble. But not only the demigods, he also descends when there's disruption amongst animals and birds, etc. So he's the well visher of all living entities. And the uh, conditioned living beings in contact with the material association, uh, they've chosen themselves to do that, to, to leave Krishna and come to the material world. What for? They have a strong desire to lord it over the resources of, material world, of the material world and become imitation lords of all they survey. This is Prabhupada's statement. So everyone is trying to become an imitation god there is keen competition amongst such imitation gods, and such competitors are generally known as asuras. When there are too many asuras in the world, then it becomes a hell for those who are devotees of the Lord. Due to the growth of the asuras, the mass of people who are generally devoted to the Lord by nature, and the pure devotees of the Lord, including the demigods and higher planets, pray to the Lord for relief, and the Lord either descends personally from his abode or deputes some of his devotees to remodel the fallen condition of human society or even animal society. Such disruptions take place not only in human society but also among animals, birds, or other living beings, including the demigods in the higher planets. Lord Sri Krishna descended personally to vanquish asuras like Kamsa, Jarasandha, and Sisupala, and during the reign of Maharaj Yudhisthira, almost all these asuras were killed by the Lord. Now he was awaiting the annihilation of his own dynasty called the Yaduvamsa, who appeared by his will in this world. He wanted to take them away before his own departure to his eternal abode. Narada, like Vidura, did not disclose the imminent annihilation of the Yadu dynasty, but indirectly gave a hint to the king and his brothers to wait till the incident happened and the Lord departed. So, here we're discussing first the difference between demanding respect and commanding respect. So, a devotee, by his behavior of pure goodness, and as an exemplary person representing Krishna, is able to command respect, that is, he doesn't ask for it, he doesn't demand it. He commands it by his example of continual transcendental goodness and behavior, you know, self-discipline and uh, compassionate nature and humility and uh, uh, being empathetic and concerned about the suffering of others and doing everything he can to help other people get out of suffering by teaching them Krishna consciousness, etc. So that's the quality of a devotee and, and therefore he commands respect, not demanding it. He commands it by his continual example of being a first class devotee. So, however, when there are difficulties in life, like Arjuna was in difficulty, before acting, Arjuna being a devotee considered the pros and cons of his action. In other words, he was very concerned about the collateral effects of his action before he acted. Whereas demons, 
they do not take this into consideration. They act because of harshness, because of uh, being, you know, whimsical and angry. And, uh, and the example is Kamsa. Kamsa is taking his sister and his brother and his, uh, uh, and her, and her husband, uh, to the, the home of, uh, Vasudeva. And all of a sudden he hears a voice saying that the eighth child of his sister is going to kill him. So immediately there's a change from this joyful, uh, ecstatic uh, experience of a newlywed uh, husband and wife being taken to the home of the husband. And all of a sudden, Kamsa wants to kill his sister. Now, Vasudeva, being a devotee, does not act out of harshness or anger or lust. He very calmly explains to uh, to Kamsa, please don't do this. It's not right to kill a woman. You know that. And plus, she's your sister. Uh, please, I promise you that every son that's born of my, myself and my wife, I will bring them to you and you can do whatever you want. Now, because Vasudeva was a continually good person, Kamsa believed him. He made a vow and Kamsa uh, understood that his this is a man of honor, so I'm he he will respect his his uh, word, and and therefore every time a child was born, Vasudeva would bring the child to Kamsa, and Kamsa was able to do whatever he wanted. He killed at least six of those children. So we see that there's a difference between demanding respect and commanding respect. The demons demand respect; the devotees command it by their continual, steady uh, act, acts of Krishna consciousness. So, demons don't know what to do or what not to do. They become very angry and speak harshly over trifles, over little issues that are not really that important. They do not know what should be done or what should not be done. They do everything whimsically according to their own desire and they do not recognize any authority. These demoniac qualities are taken on by them from the beginning of their bodies in the wombs of their mothers, and as they grow, they manifest all these inauspicious qualities. So right from the womb of their mother, they have these qualities. So the next verse, Krishna tells Arjuna, Daivi Psampad Vimokshaya Nibandana Shuri Mata Masucha Sampadam Daivim Abhijato Sipandava, this is the 16th chapter. We read the fourth, now this is the fifth verse. So Krishna says to Arjuna, the transcendental qualities are conducive to liberation, whereas the demoniac qualities make for bondage. Do not worry, O son of Pandu, for you are born with the divine qualities. So uh, people are actually born with either demoniac qualities or divine qualities, and they, they take on these qualities in the womb of the mother already, and as they get older, they develop more and more. So in the purport, Prabhupada says, Lord Krishna encouraged Arjuna by telling him that he was not born with demoniac qualities. His involvement in the fight was not demoniac, because he was considering the pros and cons. So Arjuna is always concerned about the effect of his act actions before he acts. Whereas the demons, uh, he, in other words, Arjuna was considering the respectable persons such as Bhisma and Drona should not be killed, should be killed or not killed. So he was not acting under the influence of anger, false prestige, or harshness. However, the demons do not consider these things. They act out of anger and harshness or false prestige. Therefore, Arjuna was not of the quality of the demons. For a Kshatriya, a military man, shooting arrows at the enemy is considered transcendental, and refraining from such a duty is demoniac. Therefore, there was no cause for Arjuna to limit. Anyone who performs the regulative principles of the different orders of life is transcendentally situated. So, there are many instructions here, but uh, the main point is 
that you can say, well, wait a minute, I was born in a family like myself that eats meat, and although they go, to, they they would go to church, but uh, during the week and the other six days, they were committing all kinds of sinful activities. And then one day they go to church, and they uh, have the uh, uh, they ask for blessings, and uh, the priest uh, gives them certain blessings, and they go home, and then they start sinning again all week. So that is not the situation of the devotees. The devotees, every day, they are practicing Krishna consciousness. You know, they're, they're beginning with humility and pridelessness uh, and nonviolence uh, and, and uh, tolerance and patience and cleanliness internally and externally, acceptance of a bona fide guru, and always asking permission of the guru before they engage in any major actions. These are symptoms of a devotee. And they're steady and, uh, and always uh, pursuing self-realization as the goal of life so that they can uh, serve Krishna without committing any uh, sinful activities. So these are qualities of a devotee, whereas the demons, they're overwhelmed with their false prestige. They become harsh and, and mean and angry over little trifles because they have very, very strong material desires, and they are hell-bent on satisfying those desires. Therefore, they're always in trouble, and they're giving trouble to others. Okay, so now another main point in this uh, <coughs> purport today these demons, they want to lord it over the resources of the material world and become imitation lords of all they survey. What's it mean to become an imitation lord? Well, we have an example, Pondraka. Pondraka was so crazy that he dressed like Narayana. And Narayana, of course, has four arms. And Pondraka only had two arms. So he put two artificial arms somehow or other, pasted on his body. And then he was so crazy, he sends a letter to Krishna and says, why are you imitating me? You are an imposter. Immediately stop imitating me, otherwise I'll come and kill you. Right? With my chakra or whatever. He also had a false chakra. So Krishna just laughed derisively. and He sent him back a letter and says, yes, well, your, your death is imminent. And... Uh, so, uh, Pondraka is, is, is a chatria, so, you know, he, he does come on the battlefield, and they meet each other, and when Krishna sees him with his pathetic two artificial arms, somehow, are pasted on his body, and he says, now you're going to die, and he throws his Sudarshan Chakra, and immediately Pondraka is dead, and the other kings that uh, accompanied him from uh, Benares, they also uh, were killed. So we see how crazy people are because of their lust and greed. They will even try and imitate Krishna. All the imitators of Krishna will be destroyed because it's a great offense. So uh, here uh, Narada is revealing what's going to happen in the future some of that revelation is direct, some of it is indirect. Therefore, we see that great devotees always take the advice of, of transcendental pure devotees. And asuras always reject that advice. That's the difference between demoniac persons and devotees. So we'll stop right there. Are there any questions anyone has? Yes, Prabhu. Here he said, he said also that um, uh, what is the, uh, the Lord? The Lord Abel descends personally from his abode 
or decludes some of his devotees to remodel the fallen condition of human society or even animal society. He says such disruption, the opposite, such disruption take, take place not, not only. only in human society but also in human society. How does it take place in animal society? <laughs> Uh, well, I'm not an animal, so I can't tell you. <laughs> but uh, we can believe what's being said, because Prabhupada is saying it. Um, so I don't have any example of that that I know of. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to speculate. Well. Uh, yes, I can tell you one that I know of, okay. uh, at least from the Ramcharit Manas. Uh, there's the example of uh, Kakakpusindi and, uh, and uh, Garuda. So, so Garuda, when he sees uh, Lord Ramachandra and... and uh, uh, his brother Lakshman tied up by the snake weapon that uh, I think in, uh, Indrajit threw at them, you know. So they, he was called to come and help because snakes are afraid of Garuda, birds, right? And, but when Garuda comes and sees them tied up, for one second he thinks maybe they're not God. Maybe the Lord is not God. Because of that thought, he became contaminated. And, and that is the Ramcharit Manas, okay? So, but this is what Tulsi Das is explaining. And because of that, Garuda had to get purified by going to hear the Ramayan spoken by Kakuk Busundi, a crow. Who was a, he was a brahmachari of Lord Shiva, and, and because he was disrespectful to Vaishnavas, he was cursed by Lord Shiva to become a crow. But then, uh, well, no, he wasn't cursed to become a crow by Lord Shiva. He was cursed to take birth an innumerable number of times uh, in the material world and suffer. And then his guru had uh, begged Lord Shiva not to give him such a harsh, uh, you know, destiny. So then he... Lord Shiva reduced it to, you know, he'll take birth as uh, uh, a sudra and so forth. So, and then, then he comes back to being uh, a Brahmin boy again in, uh, in Ayodhya, I think it was Ayodhya. And then he uh, approaches this guru uh, uh, who... Uh, he asked to teach him the Ramayana. And when this guru uh, is teaching him Ramayana, he gives an in, impersonal explanation of who is uh, Rama. And then the boy starts crying. And the, and the guru says, well, why are you crying? You know, is there something wrong with what I'm saying? He said, well, you, you're, you're explaining my Lord in an impersonal way. And it hurts me because I love him so much and he's so beautiful and so forth. So the guru becomes angry and curses him to become a crow. <laughs> and at that point, Lord Shiva speaks to the guru and said, you've made a big mistake. And, and the boy was right. You were, you're, you're explaining me in an impersonal way. Stop this nonsense and, and explain the Ramayana to this boy and bless him. So then the guru becomes uh, you know, awakened and he begins to speak the Ramayana correctly. And then he blesses the boy that he, he can't take back the fact that he's cursed as a cr uh, to become a crow, but he blesses him that he will eternally uh, recite the Ramayana. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and therefore, Garuda has to come and hear the Ramayana from the crow to purify himself of that one second thought that maybe the Lord is not the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So that's one example that I know. Could we, could, we, could we say that, the, um, that what took place between the gender and, and, and the crocodile was part of the... Well, yeah, that's another one. Mm 
That's another one. Yeah. Yes. You see, there are some examples. Yes. Uh, that's Gajendra and the alligator. Right. So even amongst the animals, the Lord will come to remodel the situation. <laughs> Haribo. So that's a good question. Yes. 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 Okay, what is the role of a parent who has a child that has the demonic qualities from birth, uh, from, from the womb? Well, first of all, a, a child is placed in the womb of a mother based on the consciousness of the mother and the wife at the time of conception. So if their act of conception is based on passion and lust, or if it's done out of ignorance, then uh, a suitable soul to fit that conscious state of the parents is put into the womb. Okay, so basically it's the fault of the parents. It's not, you know, Krishna's a mean guy, so he puts a, a demonically influenced child in the womb of, of, of a mother. It's not done whimsically. It's due to the parent's consciousness at the moment of conception. So, uh, at that point, uh, if the parents become devotees, then there's a chance the child will be rehabilitated. And and even if the parents are not devotees, there's a child could be rehabilitated anyway by coming in contact with a pure devotee, right? which is the case of all of us. Somehow or other, we came in contact with Srila Prabhupada by his mercy, not that we deserved it. Maybe some people deserved it, but most of us didn't deserve it. But Prabhupada went out of his way to spread Krishna consciousness and it's our good fortune that we came in contact with him by his, it, but our good fortune is his mercy. It's not that we deserved it. And, uh, and then we, we have taken up Krishna consciousness. So Krishna consciousness can change uh, the fate of a person and develop a wonderful destiny for that person. It's the only way. No other way can you change the fate uh, so most of us have been born with demoniac qualities, but by the influence of Srila Prabhupada and his disciples, uh, we've become influenced to uh, rectify that. And the only way to rectify it is by Krishna consciousness. The only thing that can stop our previous karma is engagement in devotional service. Nothing else can stop it. And once I, when I realized that in the early days when I was just being introduced to Krishna consciousness, I was worried about my, my karma already, even before I became a devotee, right? And then, and the devotees, when they were explaining these things to me, I realized this is the only way to overcome your, your karma. And we don't know what the karma is until it happens. So it's, it's an unknown thing. And then all of a sudden, we're, we're, we're overwhelmed by tragedies. So that's the reason I joined when I realized that. Yeah. There's a question on the clock. Yeah, okay, what's, wait a minute. Okay. Go ahead. The role of Jitarashtra. Well, don't forget, he was materially blind and spiritually blind. When you're spiritually blind, even though you do associate, like he was associating with Vidura, who was a pure devotee, right? But you refuse to accept good advice. So he had many chances to correct himself. Kamsa had many chances to correct himself. Ravana had many chances to correct themselves. They didn't take them. 
So there's a question. What's the question? What's the question? We don't have good reception. Your voice is breaking with them, bro. Uh, Hare Krishna, of course, a Prabhupada. Uh, Let him call you up on the phone. Yeah, I know. Uh, it's because. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I'll speak slower next time, tomorrow. But if if uh, but you but this is a recorded class. Oh, one second. This is a recorded class, so you can see it and hear it. Uh, you know, on, on our web page, right? So you can you can you know. Uh, Listen to it, stop it at any point, translate it, and then start it again. Mother, this is, uh, this is Ramrathas. Mother, this is a live class. There are 60 people are waiting. If you speak, pause it, then you will translate in Tamil like that. You want to do It's a live class. Yeah, Yeah, I understand. Okay, we'll, we'll do that tomorrow. Yeah, ma yeah Monday, ma yeah, tomorrow. tomorrow. Yes, ma yeah. We have this class yeah. every day, every day in the morning. Every day. We have it. Yeah. Okay, so we have another question. What's the question? Yeah, so the question is based on 16th chapter, verse 5 that I read. And it says... Um, uh, is it 16.5 or 16? Yeah, anyone who performs the regulative principles of the different orders of life is transcendentally situated. Okay, so Arjuna is a chatriya. So he's not accepting to perform the regulated principles of his ashram, of, of his uh, of his varna, because he's refusing to fight. But after hearing Bhagavad Gita, he accepts uh, to 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 fight. So now he's fight on, only for the purpose of protecting the principles of dharma, not for uh, personal aggrandizement. So by performing the regulative principles at different orders of life. Is one is, is transcendentally situated. So he fights on behalf of Krishna and Krishna accepts his service and therefore he's transcendental. Although he kills Bhisma, Pita Maha and, and Duryodhana and the Dronacharya, uh, still there's no sinful reaction. Well, there's two ways of following the Varnasram Dharma. One is for material well-being, and the other is for self-purification, so that one can rise to the level of Krishna consciousness. It all depends who your guru is. If you have a uh, materialistic guru, then he'll teach you to follow it for material goals. And if you have a genuine guru, he'll teach you to follow the Varnashram system for gradual elevation to the point of becoming a genuine devotee. So the whole thing depends on, you know, who's the guru. So we have so many 
uh, ritual uh, performance gurus who are doing it for a living, and therefore they don't want people to become pure devotees. They want them to have material desires, and that way they continue to make money doing materialistically inspired rituals. But if you have a genuine devotee who explain to you, that, look, this is not the real purpose. The real purpose uh, is gradual elevation to the point of Krishna consciousness. And because you are full of material desires, you can satisfy, Krishna will satisfy those desires as long as you're making some gradual spiritual advancement. Right. So if you don't have a, a guru like that, then uh, you know you'll just he'll, they'll keep you in the position of a materialistic interested person, which is what's happening today. There is there is the traditional varnashram dharma system, and there is daiva varnashram. What you want to know the difference between the two? Well, again, it depends on the guru. You you have a bona fide Vaishnava guru. He will help you to understand that the real goal of Varnashram Dharma is gradual elevation to the point of becoming Krishna conscious. And Prabhupada explains this in his letters. Daiva Varnashram means it's God-centered. Well, even the traditional system is God-centered because Vishnu is, is being uh, worshipped. However, uh, the, the gurus are keeping people materialistically oriented uh, so that they can make a living. So if you have a genuine guru, they'll, 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 I mean, Prabhupada is a genuine guru, right? So near the end of his uh, transcendental pastimes, he said, I've only done 50% of my, of what I want to accomplish. The other 50% is Varnasaran Dharma. Huh? How come he said that? Because that's for the general mass of people, for a gradual elevation. And also, Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur, when he took sannyas, this was uh, criticized by the caste Brahmins because the caste Brahmins were saying that Vaishnavas are transcendental to the Varnas and the Ashramas, right? Uh, because Varna Ashrama is reformatory, uh, you know, uh, Varnas and Ashramas for the reformation of people. Sannyas is also a reformatory. One time I said that in a GBC meeting and the sannyasis got angry at me. What do you mean? It's reformatory, you know. But it is. Prabhupada <laughs> explains, it's it's part of the varnas. Sanyas is part of the varnasram system, uh, and so it, it it is a it's to purify oneself of material desires. It's not that because you're sanyas you became some, like God, right? Basically, varnasram is mm -hmm. not transcendental. It's not transcendental because Mahaprabhu says also. Yeah, but it's very useful system to help people get gra get gradually closer to Krishna consciousness. That's why Prabhupada was was saying that we have to institute it. But what we're instituting is a daiva varnashram. No one can follow the original varnashram system strictly in Kali Yuga. Okay. But here, uh, I have a question. Yes. So uh, why don't we? Well, I'm going to inform you that uh, 
Dronacharya was a Brahmana, but he was expert in the military arts. So he taught the, Vais the, the Pandavas and the sons of uh, Dhritarashtra the, Vais the, the, the art of uh, Dhanur Veda, you see. So uh, Brahmanas can teach uh, the Brahminical principles as well as uh, the uh, Chatriya principles as well as Vaishya principles. Of course, they don't teach people to become sudras. <laughs> but uh, but they can elevate people, even from less than sudra, to uh, become Vaishnavas. Okay, so uh, you, when you become a brahmana, you can become an expert in the Dhanur Veda and, and teach others to become first class uh, uh, chatriyas or first class Vaishyas or first class brahmanas. You understand? So brahmanas are teachers. They they they're going to teach people in society how to, and they also teach the sudras how to how to behave properly, and follow their uh, their uh, uh, varna. See, and that's why it's called varna ashrama. So whatever seemingly in, inequalities exist in the varna system, there are no inequalities, but it, it sometimes it looks like that. All those are erased by the ashrama system. And that's what, that's, the ashrama system is progressive elevation. Brahmachari, grihasta, manaprasta, sannyas. Right? Doesn't matter whether you're a sudra, a vaisha, a chatriya, or a brahmana, whether you're born like that. You can go through the ashrama system and become a transcendental person. Okay? Okay, thank you very much. We'll stop right there. And Veda Narayan Prabhu, next time, I will speak slowly so you can translate. And also, if, if the uh, uh, reception or the communication is not so good, you can call up uh, Prabhuji in, uh, in uh, where, where is he living? In Hyderabad? No, Bangalore. Bangalore. Yeah, and you can you can tell him you know what your question is, and then he can ask the question, and I can answer it. All right, that's when the reception is broken. Okay, Haribo. Thank you very much. All glories to Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hare Krishna.